Hi, I'm Chris Delion for Hobby Game Dev. This is the presentation that I recently did at DIGRA 2013. DIGRA is short for Digital Games Research Association. This is the talk version of a paper which was accepted as part of their uh, conference proceedings and will be available soon through DIGRA's website. Uh, it's a paper about rules in computer games compared to rules in traditional games. Some of y'all who have been visiting Hobby Game Dev in the past may recognize that this is sort of a continuation or a most recent and formal version of a series of arguments that I've been working on sort of off and on for years uh, in a series of entries and developing and discussing now for some time. I'm Chris Delion, a PhD student at Georgia Tech in Digital Media. And I want to begin by clarifying that uh, one of the points of confusion that's come from earlier presentations of this idea is that this is really not about word choice or definitions. Uh, I don't actually care how people define the word rule. Uh, I find that uh, different, different contexts have different usefulness uh, for different definitions. I'm not trying to say one definition superior to another or that we should or shouldn't use the word rule in certain situations. All I'm trying to call attention to is that regardless of what we call them, uh, what we refer to as rules in computer games have some fundamental differences in terms of player experience from what we call rules uh, in the casual sense in non-computer games of various sorts, including board games, sports, whole gamut of non-computerized game experiences. Because it affects player experience, I think it might have an effect on how, as designers, we discuss frame and, and theorize about them, uh, but I'll try to wrap up at the end a little more idea about why this is an argument I think is worth having. I like to begin these by discussing an example of a simple game we could create together. We could put down tape on the floor, and you know, painter's tape will come back up, and we're going to make two rules about it. We'll say that you, as the player, as the runner, are not allowed to step over the tape, and are not allowed to pick up and move the tape. Notice that we have to make these rules because of the fact that you're capable of doing it. Uh, we can selectively not enforce it, so when we start, we can walk you over to the corner and walk right over the tape and not pay attention to it. Uh, but you're capable of stepping over the tape during play, you're capable of moving the tape, which is why we have to have rules about not doing it. We might put a prize at the end, let's say an Atari 2600, and say that if you can get to it without violating the rules, then you'll get the prize. And we can add a third rule. Let's say, to add a little challenge, because you're an adult and you're capable of controlling your body, Let's say you have 45 seconds to make it to the end of that maze, and if you take more time than that, then you don't get the prize. Uh, which, once again, we have to have that rule there because you're physically capable of taking the prize if you get there in more time than, it, than 45 seconds has been allotted. Notice that in each case, we could actually be both intending, you as player and me as the referee, to enforce these rules, but mess up just by a matter of disagreement or perception. So we might not be paying attention for a moment, and we could both be unsure. Did you step on a line? Did you step a little across it? Was your time 44.8 seconds or 46.2 because I'm fumbling with a stopwatch and hard to tell when you start exactly? And these, these are discussions that happen all the time in physical sports between referees, umpires, coaches, and players and fans about was it in or was it out? Was it a foul? Was it not? Uh, these become judgment calls. And the types of rules that get authored for these games, just like our maze scenario, are things that the players have to be able to keep track of in their minds because of the fact that they're capable of violating them. They have to pay attention to not violating them even accidentally, let alone strategically if they think they can get away with it. As a coach or a referee, it has to be things that we can keep our perception framing as, as uh, we can keep track of. And these, these are points that Chris Crawford made many years ago in the Art of Computer Game Design about one of the differences of a computer game as opposed to a non-computer game is that in a computer game the rules can happen at a faster or more discrete pace than what human perception could keep up with, which is not the case in non-computerized rules. This difference between the fact that we can violate the rule, and that's why we have to have the rule there as part of the game. It's central to Bernard Sweets' discussion in The Grasshopper, Games, Life, and Utopia, about really what a game is. In Bernard Sweets' example, one of the most memorable ones, is that uh, a golfer, it'd be easier to get that ball into the hole in golf by just picking up the ball and dropping it into the hole. But that what makes it golf is that we choose to take a less efficient means of doing so. We accept that, okay, I'm only going to do it by using this golf club. I'm only going to use it by trying to hit the ball with a metal club, and wherever it winds up, I'm going to play it from there instead of, you know, once again, just picking it up and putting it in the hole, which we have to have a rule there to make us use the golf club because there's other ways that we're capable of moving the ball. We don't actually need rules against things that are impossible for us to do, like um, flying in sports or, or, or moving right through other bodies without contacting them because those aren't things we're physically capable of doing. Now let's look at a different maze situation. Now you've got 45 seconds, but instead of trying to get to an Atari 2600, uh, without stepping over tape, you're trying to get from gate C18 to gate B26 before your plane taxis and you miss your flight. Uh, and suddenly, the barriers are real. 
it's no longer a matter of having to keep track of uh, careful not to step over the tape and know that you're not allowed to move it. It's the fact that you can't run through glass, steel, and other people in the airport. I mean, you could try it. It's going to slow you down considerably, right? And so suddenly this is a much different situation. And that 45 seconds, remember, you could have taken a little more than 45 and then argued or claimed or bribed or just straight up stolen that Atari from me. But in this case, if you get there in more than 45 seconds and that plane is taxied, it's not out of sportsmanship, it's not out of cooperation, it's not out of acceptance of those rules, what Bernard Sweets would call the illusory attitude. It's not an acceptance of the inefficient means that you don't get onto that plane. It's because that plane has left. Physically, it's too late. Your opportunity was lost. And so there's some differences, right, between running through this airport and running through that tape maze. And if we look at something like chess, most digital or non-digital games, board games, card games, uh, sports as well, uh, there's all kinds of things that we're capable of doing with that board that make no sense to the rules. We could take a piece and put it between four tiles. We could turn all the pieces on the side and roll them around. We can flip the board. There's all kinds of things we can do that don't make any sense in the context of the game. And so the rules wind up constraining us, the constitutive rules, as Bernard Sweets has termed for it, the things that we can do that are meaningful in the game because we're capable of doing other things with the pieces. If we look at a paper maze, now of course I like to use the tape maze because I think it's a better analogy to the airport run, but really this is the same situation if you're on paper trying to follow the maze in which you're not allowed to cross over a line. You're physically capable of doing it with a pencil or a pen. And of course, in this case, too, from the way this maze is designed, you could just go around the outside. But we accept that these are rules that you're not supposed to violate. And that as a player, you have to have in mind, you have to know these rules to respect them because you're capable of doing it intentionally or accidentally in terms of violating them. Now, Pac-Man maze. If we ask, is this more like the paper maze and the tape maze? Or is this more like the airport run? I'll argue that this is actually much more like the airport maze. Because that wall, in fact all these walls, are stronger than the mazes in the airport. You could bust through sheetrock if you really were determined. You could smash tempered glass if you just hit it in the right place and hard enough. Uh, whereas Hulk himself could not jam the joystick so hard to the side that Pac-Man would go through that wall. Uh, that wall is a very real physical barrier for Pac-Man, and it's not out of sportsmanship or respect for the rules or an acceptance of inefficient means that Pac-Man doesn't just skip through the walls. Pac-Man as a matter of how the circuitry is set up and how the program is written, is incapable of getting around that power pellet unless moving around the wall rather than trying to go straight through it. And in this way, because the limits are, are physically constrained, we don't actually have to know them to respect the rules. All we have to know is what's our goal and what are we allowed, and, and basically how to, how, to, how to manipulate it. And in this way, it makes playing these games a little bit closer to an old folk puzzle. So, for example, these old games of horseshoes and chains where you're trying to get the ring off by twisting and pushing and pulling. Uh, or this uh, old game, another folk game with nails, where you're trying to figure out how to get these two looped nails separated. And you don't actually have to know the rules. I mean, you can't take a blowtorch to it. But short of physically destroying the puzzle pieces involved, your interaction is really just sort of jamming them around to do whatever you can get away with until you reach the goal state of separating out the pieces. And this can be a harder analogy to draw to a modern cinematic experience like Drake's Fortune or the latest Tomb Raider game, but it's actually a lot simpler connection to make to an old Tiger handheld or an old other LCD type game where there's so few controls of such low fidelity and complexity, where the states on the screen and the LCD are such a direct mapping of the states in RAM, that you're just really toggling those values in memory until you can sort of configure your puzzle and you can jam the pieces around to reach an end state where you're at the end of the level, where you've knocked over the bad guy, where the health has reached zero, whatever the case is, that you've sort of navigated that physical constraint until you've achieved the desired end goal. Part of what makes this possible isn't just that the game takes place in software and is written through programming rules, uh, but rather it's that also we're playing through a mediated button. That that button can decide for us whether or not it should, extend, whether or not it should uh, activate. And so pinball, as some of y'all know my other research is based around pinball, uh, was one of the introduction in terms of game players and real-time game situations to playing by pushing buttons. Now, it's always fair play to push that button. If there's some reason why the machine decides that it shouldn't respond to it, the game will do so. The game will just not trigger the flipper when you push the button. Likewise, in a fighting game, you're always allowed to be pushing any button on the controller, but if your new character is stunned and not allowed to punch, it just won't activate. What this means, again, is that you don't have to learn the rules about how long your character is stunned, about what you are and aren't allowed to do while you're in a certain mode, or if you're poisoned by a power-up, or whatever the case. You don't have to learn those rules. The game knows and keeps track of it for you, and you can just test the limits of what you've got 
And if you can do it, it'll allow you to do it. Michael Leba uh, wrote an excellent paper kind of along these lines, but from a different angle. Uh, a few years ago, called uh, comparing, uh, basically asserting that there is no magic circle, which is also basically the title of the paper, and comparing computerized game of solitaire to a non-computerized game of solitaire. And his angle, though it's focused on magic circle rather than rules, uh, really looks at the fact that in a magic circle you've got to sort of uh, be in a particular mindset, as a Huizinga term as adapted to game studies and rules of play by uh, Salen and Zimmerman. Uh, but it's this concept in gameplay that you have to sort of accept the imaginary boundaries of, of play in order to participate meaningfully in the ritual, whereas in solitaire on the computer you do not have to accept those arbitrary boundaries because the computer just won't let you do things that don't reflect playing by the rules in solitaire. And as Michael Leva points out, this actually means that you can play solitaire on a computer sort of by trial and error. It might not be efficient, but you're capable of doing it to sort of extract from it how it works. Now, this is, I want to call attention to this because this is sort of foundational to the type of work that I'm talking about here, but I think that by, choice, by, by choosing a game, which was already a turn-based game designed for human-enforced rules, I think that uh, the paper doesn't help accentuate some of the differences that happen in digital game rules as opposed to non-digital game rules, and that's where you'll see more of my focus going here. Now, if you're paying attention to the airport scenario, you may have noticed that, in fact, there are rules and referees in an airport when you're running through it, just like there are when you're playing a sport or when you're running through my tape maze, except those rules are laws passed by legislators and those referees are police. So while you physically can't bust through drywall and sheetrock, also you can't because you'll be tackled by the police. While you shouldn't knock people unconscious that get in your way and scream in people's faces and, and ignore the, the, uh, the requests of security agents or present boarding passes where you should, uh, you're physically capable of doing those things. And maybe you'd still win the game by our definition of getting onto your plane in time before taxis, but then they're going to haul you off in handcuffs because you've got these referees who make subjective judgment calls, just like in our maze game of did you step on the line? Were you out of time? Did you follow the rules that you understood, which you had to understand, because you're capable of violating them? And once again, we have to pass laws for things only because you're capable of doing it. It would be absurd to pass a law to prevent you from doing something that's impossible to do. And this, again, is the relationship between rules and computer games, uh, where you don't have the option of violating the rule, as opposed to rules in non-computer games, where you're f fully capable of it, and that's why the rule has to exist. And I found this to be a really useful distinction for framing them. So computer game rules on the left side, console, web, or PC, whatever computerized game, including Tiger Handheld, uh, kind of in some ways line up with the laws of nature, the laws of physics or anatomy. On the right side, non-computer game rules, whether it's sports, board, card games, even something like Dungeons and Dragons, uh, fall in many ways closer to laws of society, in which you have police and legislators who have to make judgment calls, uh, and as well as you, because you have to be aware of it, um, have to know the rules. And so the, the ways in which I'm comparing them here you'll see, so the players need to explicitly learn the rules and consciously obey them to avoid disallowed actions. So you have to know the rules in the case of a sport uh, in order to not violate it. You have to know the rules in the case of a law to not accidentally uh, have a problem with it. And, th and this is not the case in computer games or physics or anatomy where you can't violate the rules because they are structural, because they are uh, they're set up in such a way you can't. You're physically incapable of violating them. And that's connected to, of course, is it possible for the player to violate the rule by accident or strategic contention? One of the things that happens in card games, certainly, maybe more so than sports even, is this notion of cheating where you can deliberately try to pull something off or get away with it because you're capable of violating the rule in a way that that's just not going to happen in the case of laws of nature like physics, where, okay, well, if I just hold my arm in a certain way, then I can slide through people or something, or in computer game rules where... That's just not really an option if you're playing computerized cards. Now, there's other ways you can hack and modify the game code and change things in memory. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, rule definition and rule violation must be at a pace and fidelity fully knowable and detectable by human perception and attention. This goes back to the point earlier that, I, like I said, Chris Crawford was writing about decades ago in Art of Computer Game Design, which is that to say that uh, you have to be aware of the laws uh, and you have to be able to perceive yourself engaging in it, which means they have to be very kind of discreet, they have to be kind of high level, they have to be understandable, uh, both for you and or for the judge of whether or not you're in violation of it. In a way that for computer games and for laws of physics and anatomy, you can throw a football for years and not know anything about the equations of physics involved in its airspeed, air resistance, uh, rotation, 
gravity and so on. Or, of course, all the complexity of your muscles and your anatomy and how they have to coordinate to make that ball fly. You can play computer games for rules and never, uh, you can play the computer games for years and never understand the ins and outs of how and why the AI do certain things or how and why certain things in the world behave as they do in the game. You couldn't write the algorithm yourself, but as long as you know how to react to it, you know enough to play it. This is unlike non-computer games and laws of society where you actually do have to understand what you are and aren't allowed to do, again, so that you are allowed, so that you'll stick to doing what you're allowed to do. Players of the game could enumerate a game's rules well enough for someone else to recreate it. So if there's a table of us and we have, um, let's say, a deck of cards, and anyone at that table knows how to play Monopoly or knows how to play poker, then suddenly everyone there can be taught how to play poker, and you can recreate that game. If we have a soccer ball or a ball that's enough like a soccer ball and a table of people and one of them really knows the rules to soccer, he or she could explain to the rest of the people, hey, here's what we are and aren't allowed to do with it, let's go out and recreate this game. Because there's so few rules, they're so easily understood by people. In a way that this doesn't really apply for if there's a set of people at a table and you've got a blank and yes cartridge and a way to program it, uh, no matter how much you've played Mega Man or a game of any reasonable sophistication beyond sort of late mid-80s, uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to really faithfully recreate all the nuances and details of how everything in that thing worked um, because you didn't have to learn those as part of the playing of it. You just, like I said earlier, have to know how to respond to them and react to them, just like laws of physics and anatomy. And so uh, soccer, even though it's a non-digital game, uh, I think it still helps us get further towards things that non-digital rules do as compared uh, things that non-digital rules and digital rules do differently. And uh, Jesper Yule uh, and Half Real did a comparison between uh, soccer rules so soccer rules include things like the play field dimensions, the ball specifications, what players can and can't do, and the wind conditions, but points out that we don't include in the rules of soccer how air resistance works, what the grass's condition is, how the human anatomy works. So it doesn't include things like how a ball behaves when it's rolling through grass. Those things we take for granted as the context within which a, so a game of soccer can happen. Now for virtual soccer, Yule's point, and the way he frames it, is that in order to make virtual soccer, we have to implement the laws of physics and anatomy explicitly at the same level as the other rules of soccer. But if you look at these two columns, one side is refereed laws, things that the referee or the players have to keep track of. The other is really physical laws, anatomy and physics. And these, of course, line up to my discussion earlier of the tape maze in contrast to the airport or the Pac-Man maze. And by Yule's wording, he sort of implies that they all become at the same level of the game's explicit rules, which, once again, I would frame as refereed laws. But my point all along is that, in fact, they're going the other direction. They're all becoming physical laws. It's, in fact, as deterministic, as consistent, as absolute, uh, that when a ball goes into that net, it will, score two, it will score the right number of points, as it is the way that the ball is going to bounce through the grass. It's uh, as impossible for a player besides the goalie to touch the ball with their hands as, again, for sort of air resistance in the game and, and how it's executed. That they all become much more mechanical and much less human-mediated. Some of the differences that these have is because we don't have to learn the rules in order to play, like Michael Leibis said, we could play solitaire to learn how to play solitaire, there's cases of games like uh, Anaway's recent Candy Box, where kind of a core mechanic is playing it to try to understand what in the heck is going on. Because all the rules are hidden from us when we start, uh, we can play at it to figure out how it works. And there are non-digital games that find clever ways to kind of recreate this dynamic. They might have the rules change during play by cards that are drawn. Uh, they might have players be able to invent rules as they go. But those are kind of the exceptions. In those cases, it's a novelty, as opposed to in computerized games, dating back from the times of the arcade, it was often by design essential that players were... The game was expected to be learned by knowing how to play it. Uh, or that the game was expected to be learned by playing it. Uh, because it weren't expected in the same way we are with a game like Monopoly or a game like soccer to be able to read lengthy instructions or to have someone coach us in it. We're expected to be able to sort of mess with it to learn how it works. Once again, the game's complexity of rules uh, falls into the domain of digital in a way that they can exceed human grasp of it uh, for many years of, of playing it. So. The Pac-Man ghosts, unlike Miss Pac-Man's, Pac-Man's ghosts are extremely deterministic. Uh, they all have a very particular system to movement in such a way that, in fact, high-level tournament, high level tournament players memorize moves for certain levels based on which power-up shows up there of how to make sure that the, as long as the player does the right moves in the right places, the ghost will always do the same things every time. 
but as to describing the algorithms of how the ghosts move and being able to simulate it in our minds, you could play Pac-Man for years. I've played it as a child, study it now, and if you stop and don't play and then try to tell me where the ghost would be in five seconds, your brain probably couldn't do it. Uh, and this is a fairly unsophisticated, historically speaking, uh, uncomplicated game at a processing level in comparison to a modern title, but even still, there's enough going on that a computer can keep track of it at many frames per second of updates, and with the human brain, we're basically ready to adapt to it, to react to it, like laws of physics and anatomy, without having a deep understanding of exactly what's going on, unlike if we were playing a game like Settlers of Catan, where we have to know about each and every piece, how it works, and what to do when we flip a card. Now, in the transition from virtual soccer to soccer, there are real laws that we're kind of trying to simulate in some sense of the word. Now, we could cartoonishly simulate it in the case of something like NBA Jam or NFL Blitz, but the important distinction is that when you have a game which is completely unrealistic in its presentation, cartoony or otherwise, then one of the most di distinct differences from one game to another can be in how those laws of physics become interpreted. So if we compare Super Mario Brothers to an old Sonic game, in both of them the players can run and jump, in both of them there are often enemies that will defeat the player if you run into them from the side, but that the player can defeat by jumping on top of them. But these games aren't really distinguished just by their graphics and just by those series of events which casually sound the same, the most significant difference is in playing one of these games to the other is the level of air control that the player has, is in how friction behaves, is in how the characters accelerate. And it's not just a matter of tuning gravity numbers, it's not just a matter of tuning friction numbers, it truly is a different algorithm in place that's affecting what happens when you let go of the jump button mid-jump. That's affecting what happens if you hold back after jumping forward. Moreover, it's often it can be inconsistent within the same game. So the rules of controlling the uh, physics for the player's character can be different from those of an enemy or from a moving power-up or otherwise projectiles and other things in the games. If you're interested in this level of approach to game design and real-time interactive spaces, Steve Swink's Game Feel is one of the most uh, thorough and, and early, I think, investigations into the style of game design and these aspects of it. It's got really an entire chapter kind of dedicated to camera and jump movement in a game like Super Mario Brothers and how that affects the way that the game feels and plays. Because many of these old games, even old platformers, the things that would distinguish them wasn't, again, maybe so much about uh, what was going on narratively, even though, you know, clearly these are four different settings, but at a gameplay level, had to do with when you're jumping over a gap trying to make a platform, and a flying enemy or projectile hits the player. Does the player get knocked backwards? Does the player fall straight down? Does the player keep going, begin flashing, and become invincible? And suddenly, that difference, that little subtle difference in how physics and collisions get handled, has a lot to do with the difficulty of the game being played, and the types of enemy movements that become either more or less difficult for the player, and the types of players' attacks that can be used to counteract and deal with these situations. So one way of explaining this, in a way that I think gets people to discuss it, uh, hopefully in a productive way, is that if we look at rules in the sense of board and sports games, then we could actually assert that all video games kind of have the same rules. Bear with me, because I realize this is, this is kind of a weird thing to say, but so, aside from tournament meta rules, so other than something like, uh, okay, we're not going to use Valdo in this tournament because he's imbalanced or something, or we're not going to play in this certain level of Smash Brothers because it's just too, too randomized and unpredictable. So aside from tournament level meta rules, the basic rules, in terms of, again, thinking of rules in the board or sports game sense of rules that prevent you from doing things you're physically capable of doing, things that you could do, but you're not supposed to do, so only use standard input devices to interact with values in RAM and save files. This rules out things like Game Genies or Production Replay, uh, various debugging devices, or even just hex editing save files to skip ahead. Do not alter the hardware. This goes back to the old days of PCBs and uh, arcade machines, but basically if you're soldering new chips onto it, uh, you're probably cheating somehow by kind of everyone's definition. Uh, the player credited is the person playing, so no substitution. Don't have, you know, just like you wouldn't have someone else take your SATs and put in your name. Uh, if someone else plays and you put in your initials, everyone's going to probably pretty recognize that you cheated at it. Uh, if it's two or more players, don't disrupt other players out of game. So if you're both playing Street Fighter 2 at the same cabinet, you shouldn't physically strike the other player or get in the way of their hands as they're trying to control it. And there are games that, that play with this fact by inverting it. So, you know, an uh, art game like Button, the whole idea is that players are supposed to disrupt each other out of the game, and that sort of helps draw attention to that being the exception to really the rule. And then lastly, that software should be used in its officially released state, 
Unless, of course, all players have the same mods and know that said mods are installed. So one of the ways people used to cheat openly about these kind of things is that they have locally modified version of their files that makes characters easier to see in the dark or allows them to see through walls or otherwise uh, gives them an edge, an advantage, outside of the way that the game was released and intended to be played. But really, so beyond these, and, you know, this sort of exists on a continuum, but the gist is that these are kind of our rules for games. And there's a complex space around uh, entering cheat codes and so on, uh, but if we interpret it as uh, what you're allowed to do when playing the game is accepted, again, it becomes a meta discussion of, of when players are okay with these things and not. But what it does do is it helps, I think, accentuate the distinction between non-computerized game rules, which all are about things that you are capable of doing and rule there to stop you from doing it, as opposed to digital game rules, which in many cases are structural, physical, mechanical, including the events, the things that if they're happening in real life, we might call attention to as a rule, exist really on the same plane as not being able to walk through a wall, as being able to jump to a certain height. In closing, uh, I'd like to use this old quote from John Locke and some thoughts concerning education. This is, of course, not about game rules when he said it. Uh, it's just that we mistake that for analogy which is not, and suffer our understanding to be misguided by a wrong supposition of analogy where there is none. My concern and my reason for highlighting rules in digital games as opposed to rules in non-digital games is actually from a gap that I've had uh, expressed to me from students in different educational game programs or different programs that try to teach game development, game design, where the gist is they'll say that they really followed it while they were working on designing board games, card games, and sports activities. And then as soon as they went to electronic space, digital games, they feel like they're totally starting from scratch. They, they kind of couldn't carry over some of the same practices, or they couldn't really figure out um, the mapping from one of those to how to relate that to digital game space and take advantage of all the affordances of digital games in a way that produced something more than just a digitized version of what would be a board or card or sport game. Uh, I've heard this complaint both from students and from professors, and it's something that I think that we maybe don't know as much about authoring rules for digital games as we think we do, uh, because there's a lot of design, discussion, theory, uh, valid good practice about the design for non-digital rules that I think we have maybe, by analogy, assumed applied to video games that in practice doesn't as much as we might think it does. And so this is where I think things like game feel are starting to show up to help us analyze, okay, well, this is really, there's something weird going on, or something kind of different, um, and what can we do about looking at how that affects perception, how that relates to the player experience, um, and, and this also affects potentially learning through a game with rules. And so um, because of the fact that to play a non-digital game, you have to learn all the rules, there's a sense that you can embed a system in the rules, and that players will come to learn that system, because they have to learn the rules to play the game. But in a computerized game, as I've explained earlier, you actually don't have to learn all the rules in order to play it. You simply have to learn your complement to it, your way to react to it. And as long as you can find an optimal strategy through it, a power-up to always go for, a technique to always use, to move in, uh, a certain strategy that always works, you can kind of stop learning about what's happening underneath in the game. And even though that simulation might be an accurate embodiment of a, of a theory or a system, uh, you don't have to learn it because our relation to it is so different than non-digital rules. But these are just sort of dovetailing out into different areas that I'm interested in continuing to investigate. I hope others out there who are curious will join me in discussing and analyzing these kind of spaces uh, of, of the differences in between computer game rules, non-computer game rules, how those might affect our design practices and our study of the subject. Uh, if you've got questions, you can certainly email me at cdeleon3 at gotech.edu. It's my school address. Uh, you can find out more of my material at hobbygamedev.com. And I've got, of course, lots of images that I've borrowed for this, but in general, if you Google, you'll find them. Uh, for a thorough source, uh, list of sources that are cited, uh, you can find those in the paper version of the proceedings from DGRA 2013 once those become available online. Thanks so much for taking the time to hear about this presentation. Uh, hopefully, continue the research this area. And again, if you have thoughts, questions, feedback, suggestions, sources you want to point me to, of other things I should be aware of when continuing to investigate this space, by all means, please reach out. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.